first of all, I want to thank Dr. Cameron for this wonderful, exhilarating presentation that gave me a lot to pause about and to think. And let me tell you a bit about myself because I will be stressing that this is all about relationships. So it is not about you hearing me, it's about you feeling me and having a relationship. So let me give you pieces to, to know. I am the son of Carlota and the son of Joselin. Carlota was a university professor. Joselin was a salesman. He sold uh, products for the building of homes in Puerto Rico. Mainly, he sold uh, for a company that produced windows. Now, I am a follower of Christ. I became a follower of Christ because he chose to elect me, just like he has chosen to elect all of us. And since we will not go into further theological consideration about electing, let me be brief. In this electing that God did, he chose to elect me within a Seventh-day Adventist church. But I am not a Seventh-day Adventist. I am a Christian who belongs to a Seventh-day Adventist church. Shall we say amen? amen. So we're preaching now. <laughs> so Dr. Cameron invited us to think of a puzzle. And here is my answer to his puzzle of integration. It is, after all, Dr. Cameron, all about Jesus. But instead of focusing on this puzzle that my imagination produced based on his presentation, the particular one and all of the other two, I will be talking about this puzzle. This puzzle, Dr. Cameron, has no corners. <laughs> Not only has no corners, they are missing pieces because instead of focusing on integration based on a positivistic, modernist, lineal epistemology. And by the way, another piece for you to know me. One of my students of MB 560 slash A60 that I will be teaching next quarter, and unashamedly, I am making an advertisement for it. <laughs> this student, is as an artist beside being a wonderful student. And she chose to draw two cartoons based on my lectures. And the first cartoon and the one I will be sharing about, but I will not be showing it because I don't own it. So it's her cartoon. And the cartoon that she drew during the time that she was writing the final paper. And the cartoon is, a female seated, writing in a piece of paper, and he says, at least I learned to spell epistemology. <laughs> <laughs> she did very well, by the way. By the way, she did very well. But so if for those in SIS know Daniel Shaw and he's all about awesome, well, Johnny is all about epistemology. <laughs> the epistemology will be like the rock under the furniture in your living room. The furniture happens to be the ideas, the schemata, that Dr. Cameron Lee has been sharing it all with us. I have no disagreement with the ideas. I do have a couple of pieces of furniture that I like to bring, but I am particularly interested in talking about the rock. As I read his paper and as I listened to him, I saw him use different rocks at different times, both uh, lineal and postmodern. Well, I will be paying careful attention to the rock. That will be my response to your presentation. Now, this uh, rock that I presented before, this uh, jigsaw puzzle that I presented before with missing pieces, is missing pieces because the expectation, the epistemological expectation is to abide and to relate, not to understand and put everything in order. Am I communicating? The modern epistemology assumes that it has access to the good questions and it will have access eventually to the right answers if the, the right processes are discovered versus the 
postmodern epistemology assumes that it is all about relationships and networking, and it, the gaps in the relationships will be the feeling of the integration between separate disciplines. Why is it gaps in networking? Because the assumption in a postmodern epistemology is that there's no need for integration. Everything has been integrated already. Well, you may not see it, but all is part of an ecological network. And I have two renditions that I borrow from the internet. <coughs> the one on your left represents a more biological, in fact, this is in ecology, network ecology. And this is one of their presentations. And I have no more to say about that because I am not a biologist and know nothing more about it. The one on the right represents a Christian perspective on this network ecology. And the Sabbath brought you to attention to this particular network ecology because God is the one holding the planet, and all of the ecology within it together. By the way, every time I say ecology, I mean humans and non-humans. I mean animated and inanimated. I mean physics, biology, molecular biology, etc., etc., etc. They don't need to be integrated. They are all part of the same network. But there are gaps that we need to discover in order to establish those relationships. Now, the ideas that we're talking about have to do with how do we navigate the continuum between scientific descriptions of God, creation, and the teachings God left, and is still unfolding via the Holy Spirit, the Bible, current and ancient Christian literature, as well as personal illuminated truth that God chooses to give like gold nuggets. Wow, I, I am tired of reading that sentence. <laughs> but that's what a dyslexic brain produces. This Jigs apostle we are so-called solving, though that is not the verb in my epistemology, it will be relating with instead, was a is part of what God has done for us. Sabbath has nothing to do with works for producing goods that can impress God and can earn us a part of salvation. Parenthesis or footnote, though many Seventh-day Adventists, not all, but many, believe they are earning credit. <coughs> and they are better than anybody who is not keeping Sabbath 24 hours. <coughs> Because in their minds, I would suggest small minds, they think that they are impressing God by adding something to salvation and justification. But that is definitely, ah, what I, that's not what I'm saying. Ah. Have you been warned, or warned already? Because it is everything about salvation in Jesus. For by grace you have been saved. And I will not read the, all of the passages because otherwise I will not be able to finish in 15 minutes. Though I set the timer for 19. <laughs> <laughs> now, I do need to say of this passage, verse 10, that it talks about good works. But who's the one preparing them? Is God the one preparing them in advance? Is not us impressing God? So my dear Seventh-day Adventists, who are narrow-minded and short-sighted. By the way, did I tell you Presbyterians are found to be that way, many of them also? <laughs> oh, oh, don't forget my Pentecostal Assemblies of God. <laughs> Shall I continue to mention denominations? All those that think that their label is the denomination name instead of Christian are like that, or are in the direction towards that. Now. I am a volunteer pastor in the local Glendale Seventh-day Adventist Church and plan to continue being so because the Lord called me to that place. The Lord called me to the Seventh-day Adventist. But the calling was not to Seventh-day Adventist to begin, and the most important, the calling is to follow my Jesus, Lord. Now, the passage of John 20, 
27 to 29 tells us clearly that this epistemology that we're talking about is reflected in the Bible. It's an epistemology of networking. And there's a network here that is revealed between the creation time before sin ever entered, the current time, and the restoration to which Jesus was heading to. And the connection is, ah, ah, do you see it? The mouth, the eating habits. It is about eating. It's about chewing. The connection is that we have bodies that were created at the beginning. We have bodies that are currently eating, and there will be bodies in heaven that will continue to eat. Even Jesus ate fish upon resurrection. Read the passages. I will not be reading them. Note them down. In Luke 24 is the second instance of Jesus preparing uh, breakfast, and I assume eating with them. It would have been inconceivable for him to prepare breakfast and not eat. His, his body had a stomach and all of the other parts, intestines, and shall I continue down the, the line? All those parts were there. Those that are dualists and whose epistemology is dualism are to be disturbed at this time. So if you're disturbed, I was expecting that. It means you're a dualist. You see a discontinuity. And the rock of your epistemology presents that there are different, separate, discrete fields. Mine is showing one of all together in a network of relationships. Wow, am I behind or what? So there is Ish and Isha, the true names that God gave them. The Adam and Eve are secondary names that come afterwards for in the story, in different moments, not simultaneously. But there you see them. Now, Imordino Yang introduces a very important set of ideas uh, in her latest book. And I will not have time to read the passages, but empty, oh, is this one. Do you believe we live in a compartmentalized, divided, dualist world? Is, if so, you need integration. If not, you have the alternative postmodern world, world where we are integrated already and we are networking our relationships. Imordino contributed, by the way, I am free and happy to share the PowerPoint. I see some people taking pictures. You don't have to worry about that. I have it in a jump drive. If you have something to put it, I can give it to you at the end. Relax. <laughs> The dualist propositionally distinct realms of cognition, emotions, morality, and all the areas associated with spirituality and religious reasoning are not equal and not uh, and subordinated within the modern world. But in the postmodern world, they are all equal and they are all already in a network. And these are two distinct ways of conceiving the universe. Imordino has been doing research at the University of Southern California. Did I mention we study at the same place, a place called Harvard University School of Education? Just by chance. Now, they say that everybody who studies at Harvard finds a way to bring Harvard to whatever conversation they have. <laughs> that was my, my try. The epistemological network that she suggests, based on the studies that have discovered the integration between the cognitions that have to do with reasoning and the frontal lobe and the emotional responses that have to do with the limbic system, simultaneously being triggered and simultaneously taking shape in the scans and MRIs of the brain, she is pointing out the discovery that we, in the postmodern world epistemology already believe was the case. She's giving us graphical studies to discover it. In summary, roles of truth, proposition and virtue ethics, 
that suggests virtue ethics, that there's only one correct, ultimately appropriate response to any, to any situation that you find yourself in, in everyday life. And the meaning and narrative ethics that suggests that you have to pay attention to the context and it will be more, it will be closer to ethics that have to do with the behaviors of people. Minimizes narratives uh, that have to do to prioritizing emotions and the propositional virtue ethics maximizes them and departs from propositions that are understood to exist outside of context. So enough for that. Jesus belongs, I'm coming now to the book of Hebrew and to the Sabbath keeping in the New Testament. You don't need the Old Testament for Sabbath keeping. The New Testament is enough. The Jesus of, me, of the New Testament and the book of Hebrews is a Jesus of the sanctuary, but this time the heavenly one. And he's ministering based on all of the laws and regulations that the Hebrews practice according to the books of Leviticus and the other books of the Old Testament that present this versus the Melchizedek heavenly sanctuary priest who is practicing according to the laws of the New Testament. And the law of the New Testament, of course, is the law of love. By the way, did I mention that Leviticus 19.18 is where Jesus was quoting from when he said, love your neighbor as yourself? So it was always supposed to be about love. <laughs> there are those that have the illusion they can leave laws behind and only abide in grace. This Kim Kardashian table, whoops, <laughs> it's time to stop. It is impossible to hide from laws. We don't have a choice. The laws that are supposed to protect us against terrorists only kill two, terrorists, two Americans a year versus a lawnmower that kills 69 Americans a year. We have invented laws to protect ourselves against it suppose safety hazards, and we have invented ways to worship God that come according to our invented laws. I invite you to consider, along with Dr. Cameron and Dr. Miyoung, to keep the Sabbath and follow the advice of the Lord instead of the invented laws of humanity. Thank you. Thank you.